Greetings from Botswana. I have something to share to you today, share with you today from the Word of God. I'm looking at the parable of the sower. Many of you are familiar with this. Uh, I'm going to look at it in kind of a limited way, but I'd like you to remember that I have, uh, in the description below, I have lists of scriptures. They're all taken from the King James Bible. So they are there for your perusal. Uh, by the nature of YouTube, I tried to keep these a little shorter, but I want to give you the information that you need uh, to go forward. You know, when I look around today, I should even say look around, when I go around today, time and time and time again, the churches are all following the Word of God. That's their basis. Oh, yes, we believe in the Word. How many people I have heard say, oh, I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. And it's distressing to say that these things by themselves are, are meaningless. I don't mean if they were sincere that it wouldn't be worth something. And they think they are sincere. But Satan has fooled them. He has kind of deceived them into accepting parts of, of the Word of God. I have this from Acts 20:27, 20, where Paul was writing, For I have not shunned to declare unto you the full counsel of God. We need the full counsel of God's Word. So today we're looking at the parable of the sower. And as you see, that is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, the sower was sowing the Word, sowing the Word of God. And there were four seeds that fell. The first seed fell on stones, or gravel was by the wayside. Uh, the second seed fell in shallow soil. One says stony soil with a stony ground underneath. Uh, the third one fell amongst thorns. And of course, the fourth one fell in good soil. But what I'd like to look at now is especially the second seed and perhaps referring a little bit to the third seed because this is where the stumbling comes in. Let me just read this. This is from Mark. Like I say, I have... I have uh, a list of the other scriptures uh, at the bottom of the page in the description. Although the, the list is not from the full parable of the sower, but from the explanation of the parable of the sower. So here we go. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves. And so endure, but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And going on, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Now, the first part that I want to do is this is uh, I took this from Mark 13, 16 and 17. This is how you see the sower is sowing the word and they receive it with joy. But then it says later on, they are offended when affliction or persecution arise. In other words, I see it kind of this way. Everybody wants to think that they're a friend of God. They're a friend of Jesus. They're going home to heaven when they die. They don't have to worry about any of these things. Okay. And so when they hear this, especially if they are in distress and such at the time, they hear how Jesus loves them, how he died on the cross for their sins, how he wants to take them uh, for one of his children. And, and uh, of course, without that, you know, we are children of wrath. And so they receive this with joy. But then as they go along, then obedience to the word doesn't become so easy. And maybe they are offended by this. Okay, they may be persecuted for the word's sake if they have to make tough choices that others wouldn't make. They say, oh, why aren't you doing this when everybody else does? Why won't you drink alcohol? And I'm not saying, I know that a little alcohol is allowable biblically. I won't get into that right now. But I'm just saying we do things out of obedience to the Lord. We love him and we also follow his instructions, what he says. And so it may be inconvenient at some point. You know, we need to tell a lie or we need to be worldly and go along with the crowd. Uh, and so we don't like this or we are or we are persecuted uh, directly. And so what happens is we are offended. Uh, 
we deny the Lord. Basically, it comes to one point we just kind of deny our faith. And uh, we will be forgiven. If we repent, we will be forgiven. But what happens is, instead of that, we don't want to admit that we have sinned. And so we kind of cover it up. We kind of blow past it. We focus on the positive parts of Scripture rather than the negative. And when it says immediately they're offended, I would just dare to say that most of the time, when this happens, uh, people aren't turning away, full away from Christianity. But what they do is they twist it so that uh, they can do what they want to do. And so they become Christians in name only. And they may do many good things. They may go to church every Sunday. Uh, however, they have begun denying the Lord and accept that they should repent and turn back uh, they ultimately will be lost. Uh, the reason that I wanted to share the other part of this is because among the thorns, uh, such as the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, they are very deceitful, and the lust of other things entering in. And that's often where the offense at the word comes in, when we can't give in to what we want to do. And we don't understand that. I mean, the, the preacher who was telling us to be saved never told us that part that we'd have to deny ourselves and take up our crosses daily and follow the Lord. Uh, so this is how I see it. And it's a real danger today. And I just want to point a few things out to you because as I've been going church to church, I mean, I hear this. I don't hear this in a small way. You know, it is possible for Christians to have disagreements over, over portions of the world. Oh, I see it a little this way. I see it. You see it a little that way. But it's something when someone is just going fully against parts of the word, parts that you would think that they would know. And especially if it's the leadership, because they're supposed to be steering the people right. And so I just, uh, I listed a few examples that I've run into. Uh, one is that we have had some friends. And by this, uh, we have been hearing about that their leadership was uh, planning to post who was tithing and who was not tithing? This is again, this is like a secondhand information, but uh, from what I have seen, there is a very strong bent toward money, and the word says we cannot serve God and Mammon. It has to be one or the other. But the Scripture says plainly that we are to do our alms in secret. So why would you ever post on a board who is giving and who is giving what? That makes no sense. And this is a pretty easy scripture to know. This is uh, straight from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 7. And so seeing things like this, you know, you ought to be alarmed. You shouldn't be following it. Now, what you do from there, I'm not telling you to abandon the, the church or pastor. Or I'm not telling you that. But I'm saying, let's hold on to the truth. And at least between you and the Lord, because that's what he wants. He wants the relationship. Hold on to the truth. Another one I saw that was really bad is, uh, but the church is very much into self-esteem. You know, it's the self-love, elevating self. And he had numerous critiques that were directly against the word of God. And one of those critiques is when Jesus is called the Lamb of God. He actually criticized it. He said, why should he be called the Lamb of God? Jesus is better than that. That's demeaning. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the word of God calls him the lamb. And the book of Revelation, he is referred to as the lamb 26 times. In the rest of the New Testament, he's referred to the lamb four times. And in the Old Testament, I saw two times. That's 32 times that Jesus, who is the word of God, refers to himself as the lamb of God. My theory is that because this church really doesn't talk about sin, and it doesn't talk about the need of repentance. You see, when you talk about the sacrifice lamb for sin, you're, t I mean, you're kind of indicting yourself. You're saying, yes, we need this. Yes, we are sinners in need of repentance. And so that is my theory why this is so offensive to him. But obviously, he is directly contradicting the word. And that's really the part I want, wanted to point out. Another thing in communication we had uh, through a social media and sharing a little bit about the end times and about the order of things. And 
the person shared back, I do not know if this was a pastor or not. I'll assume that it wasn't. But the person was just saying, well, I haven't really looked at the end times that much. As far as I knew, Jesus came at the end of, comes at the end of the tribulation, which, you know, he does. But uh, he said, I really haven't looked at it. Truthfully, I've had no vision about it. This was really alarming to us because the Bible spells out what's going to happen. But this guy is waiting for his own vision. This man is open to deceit. This is an alarming trend directly away from the word when we are told that the word of God has everything that we need to be perfect and to overcome uh, the temptations. Another, another one that I found was uh, the declaration that sin is not powerful. And yes, this came from the same one who talked about the lamb. Uh, how about looking at Romans 7, 18 to 24, where it says that in our flesh dwells no good thing, where Paul is ending at the end of this passage, just saying, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The good that I want to do, I can't. I have no power. When I want to do good, evil is present with me. Sin is not powerful. Isn't that what put Jesus on the cross? So you have to see that some of these things that are distressing me are simply because uh, not only are we not knowing the word, but things that are rather obvious, uh, you know, they're just you're being taught the direct opposite of what's there. And I even was uh, listening again to a video the other day from, uh, I think the YouTube channel is Answers in Genesis. They do a lot of good work uh, about the Bible and exposing uh, you know, creation and the truths that God has. But to see that even in some of these commentaries on the Bible, they are telling you not to believe Genesis 1 when God plainly says he has created the, the, the world in seven days, really, the seventh day he rested. But not literal days. They say, no, you can't take that literally. We don't really know what they are. Why would they say that? There is nothing within the word to tell us that. And there are things that would tell us, no, that can't be the case. But instead, they have doubts because of the, because of the lusts of other things entering in. Maybe wanting to be approved of men who don't approve of the six-day creation. Uh, so you see how dangerous it is. It is a dangerous time when the blind lead the blind. Hold everything up to the word of God like the Bereans did in Acts 17, 11. Try to search the scriptures to see if it is so. If you need to confront the person speaking, do that gently. But do as the Lord bids you, but at the very least, hold fast to the word and don't hold fast simply to what men are saying about the word. Make sure that's actually what it says. May God bless.